Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for taking that turn at the end. <laughs> nicely, <laughs> nicely done. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> at least the readings this week are pretty uplifting. <laughs> yeah, that's you know <laughs> that's helpful. I needed this week. Yeah. Um any thoughts from last week? We ended second Peter and started a little bit of John. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, we can just jump right in. We've got a few chapters to get through anyway. Um, can someone read first John two, one to seventeen for us? Susan? My little children, I am writing this to you so that you may not sin. But if one does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the expiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And by this, we may be sure that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, but disobeys his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him truly love for God is perfected. By this, we may be sure that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment, which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new commandment, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness still. He who loves his brother abides in the light and in it, but there is no cause for stumbling. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil. I write to you, children, because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father, but is of the world. And the world passes away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. <laughs> Well, where are the women? <laughs> Mine yeah. has all the women. Mine has brothers and sisters. And okay, so what version do you have, Helen? I have the New Oxford Annotated Bible, New Revised Standard Version. Well, that's a newer one than Vita and I have. Yeah. yeah. What do we have, yeah. Susan? The Revised Standard. It's the Revised Standard Version, College Edition. Yeah. It's from Bible. Yeah, I've, I've read that those different people he's addressing is is can be interpreted as different levels of spiritual awareness. So the people that are young are the ones that are just coming into their Christianity, and then those that are in the middle, they're still learning, and then the fathers are kind of like you know the prophets or the disciples who are more advanced in their spiritual training and knowledge. So. I thought that helped a little because that section is kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I was taught, you know, in grade school that um, uh, the use of the masculine pronoun is meant to include everyone in in contexts like this. Uh, and I don't know <laughs> how uh, true or not that is, but I mean, that that's how we were Todd, you know, back back then anyway, that he didn't always refer to just men, but 
you know, the, then the question is, well, when does it include everybody? When is it universal and when is it just particular to the male yeah. sex? Right. So, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. Mine says, and um, let's see, verse nine, it says, uh, where are we here? Whoever says I am the light while hating a brother or sister is still in the darkness. So I, this one does include women too. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the repetition and the addressing of everyone too is supposed to boost confidence and reassure them that he's invested in them and that they're all worthy of being saved. So I think he's, he's yeah. trying to name everybody. And you know, when you do that, that you fail miserably. <laughs> Anytime you try to list yeah. everyone, you forget someone, but yeah. So it was meant to be comforting. And mine yeah. also says, I am writing to you young people, not young men young people mm -hmm. so it is a more inclusive yeah it's trying to see and it's hold on our oh i'm sorry go ahead uh, um so the revised standard that susan and i have does have a footnote that uh, is exactly what you were saying that fathers is addressing the age aged and young men the youth yep Yeah, it looks like the message kind of went off of that footnote because it's more, I'll just read it. This is verse 12 through, I don't know, 14, let's say. I remind you, my dear children, your sins are forgiven in Jesus's name. You veterans were in on the ground floor and know the one who started all this. You newcomers have won a big victory over the evil one. And a second reminder, dear, dear children, you know the father from personal experience. You veterans know the one who started it all and you newcomers, such vitality and strength. God's word is so steady in you. Your fellowship with God enables you to gain a victory over the evil one. I like so, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They decided to focus on the different levels of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where you're at, which is nice because that takes gender right out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think uh, verse seven, I was investigating because he talks about the old command. I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one. And so I was like, which one is he talking about? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I did some research and I think that he's referring to Leviticus 19.18, which says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So once again, the Bible is pretty consistent on its messages, Old Testament, New Testament. And I think that's really important, you know, if you're coming from the Jewish tradition and trying to convert Jewish people to Christianity, that you should be able to quote the Torah or any of the Old Testament pretty quickly and show how it works with Jesus. Um, it's interesting. They have it all at their fingertips. And also he's explaining that they're not throwing out the old rules mm -hmm. old beliefs or just adding right. or reinterpreting or slightly changing re-emphasizing other things right this yeah. first made me think of uh, jesus's command to love one another and now i'm realizing how much he built on previous mention of that um in the the old testament yep so thank you for that connection. I, I had not gotten that before. Yeah. And it's to make it all familiar and less scary. Mm -hmm. so. No. Uh, can someone read the rest of the chapter for us? No, I can. Oh, Helen? Okay. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> you can do the next one. Okay. Okay, children. It is the last hour, as you have heard that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remain, remained with us. But by going out, 
they made it plain that none of them belonged to us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and all of you have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and you know that no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is Christ? That, this is the Antichrist. This is the one who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father, and everyone who confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he has promised us, eternal life. I write these things to you concerning those who would deceive you. As for you, the anointing that you received from him abides in you, so that you do not need anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it is taught to you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he is revealed, we may have confidence and not be put to shame before him at his coming. Um, I guess one more. If, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who does right has been born in him. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yeah. So this whole passage is really, um, he's trying to point out the false prophets that Gnosticism has led to. So we've been hearing about Gnosticism a lot lately. Um, I guess it was really big then. And I was going to read to you a little from my study Bible. They have a section on Gnosticism because I don't know that much about it. Um, but it says one of the most dangerous heresies of the first two centuries of the church was Gnosticism. Its central teaching was that spirit is good and matter is evil. From this unbiblical dualism flowed five influential errors. One, the human body, which is matter, is therefore evil. It is to be contrasted with God, who is Holy Spirit, and therefore good. Uh, two, salvation is the escape from the body, achieved not by faith in Christ, but by special knowledge. Um, huh. okay. I guess I can read the others, but that's the that second one especially is important to this passage. Yeah. yeah. So, and then the whole idea that that Jesus, like the human part of Jesus wasn't connected to his, the spiritual, like divine part of Christ. And so Jesus didn't become divine until baptism. And um, and then Christ left him before he died on the cross. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And that's called a Serinthianism. What is it? Serinthianism. Huh. Um, a man named Serinthus uh, preached about this, said that the divine Christ joined the man Jesus at baptism and left him before he died. Oh, heavens. And so that takes away the whole, like, um, God's seed, you know, the spiritual, you're born again in the, in the perfect seed. So it kind of, it takes away that whole lineage. Yeah. And what, whatever happened to the Genesis part that says, and God created man, and he was good, you know? Yeah. You know? <laughs> and not, the body is not evil. The body is, we were created in God's image. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah, and so once they said that the body is evil, then they felt like they could do whatever they wanted in their body, because it didn't matter. Oh, really? And so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this Sorrentis Sorrent uh, was maybe the um, founder of Gnosticism or I don't know I don't know if he's that but he's the one that said uh if he's the one that promoted the idea that Christ came down as a spirit and lived in Jesus and left yeah kind of denying the direct connection um to Jesus having the seed of God and he did not believe that Mary was a virgin he believed that um Jesus was the son of Mary and Joseph, and that 
Christ's spirit came into him and left him. So, hmm. yeah. And since matter, including the human body, was irredeemably corrupt and temporary, indulging in it had no eternal consequence. So, yeah. <laughs> you can see why this would be a problem for Christianity. It's a very big problem. Very big uh, problem. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why, it, I mean, I think almost all of these that we've been reading have addressed Gnosticism at some point. They just don't call it that because it probably wasn't called that yet. Yeah. So how did that's the whole... get that, that name, Gnosticism? G um, it's G N O S S. Yeah, it comes from Greek, um, Gnosis, which means knowledge. And it's the idea that you have to have special knowledge oh. to get into heaven. Yeah. Okay. So that's why he talks about you have everything you need already. There's no secret knowledge that you need to possess that only Gnostics can give you. And then the whole term antichrist is because they don't really believe in Christ incarnate like we do. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And then verse 22, he's saying, whoever denies that Jesus is Christ, that's a big central poor belief for us. Yeah. So um, if you deny, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, how about it? Was this part of the whole um uh discussion about in the first few years of the after Jesus died it was Jesus truly divine mm -hmm. didn't that didn't that lead into the councils of Nicaea or am I um incorrect yeah I think so yeah yeah so it seems like this was part of that um philosophical yeah argument. right and that's why John and Peter and James are all like no we're eyewitnesses we were there and so as those people die off, then you have more and more people questioning everything because we don't have any eyewitnesses anymore. Um, yeah, I can easily see that happening today. But what really happened? I have to have proof. <laughs> mm -hmm. <Good luck. laughs> so Gnosticism pretty much died out without leaving a modern offshoot uh, religion I, I take it I mean, I've not heard I'm not any. I'm not sure I'd have to research that I think there's probably Gnostics still today I would think there's the Gnostic Bible right that has yeah. some of the um it has like there's a chapter supposedly by Mary in it and I can't remember oh um so I, I um, think it's alive and well but don't quote me on that. I don't know a lot about Gnosticism, like I said, but I do know there is a Gnostic Bible with different yeah. writings from the time. A Gnostic, Gnostic Church. Never seen a Gnostic Church. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So he's just trying to refocus people on, yes, there was a Christ. Yes, I was there. You don't believe in Christ. You're against Christ. Yeah. And you're against God. Yeah. Yeah. But I liked verse 27. He says, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. Yeah. And um, this also refers to the new covenant from Jeremiah 31. 34, it says, no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will give their wickedness, I will forgive their wickedness, and will remember their sins no more. Another tie-in. Yeah. And then, let's see. Oh, I had a good footnote for that section, too. For verse 27. Uh, this is from the New, Intervash, New International Version Study Bible. It says, the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit does not involve revelation of new truth or the explanation of difficult passages of scripture to our satisfaction. Rather, it is the development of the capacity to appreciate and appropriate God's truth already revealed, making the Bible meaningful in thought and daily li living.
Which is kind of what we do at Bible study. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right, Steve, do you want to read chapter three for us? Sure. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. And we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins is either has either seen him or known him. Little children, do not little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Everyone who commits sin is, is a child of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the very beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born of God do not sin, because God's seed abides in them. They cannot sin, because they have been born of God. The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed in this way. All who do not do it, what is right are not from God, nor are those who do not love their brothers and sisters. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. You must not be like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not be astonished, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Whoever does not love abides in death. All who hate a brother and sister are murderers, and you, um, and you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. We know love by this, that he, had, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's good and sees a, a brother or sister in need and yet help let refuse and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts. He knows everything. Beloved, in our hearts do not condemn us. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask, because we obey his commands, commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that, you, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. Sounds familiar. <laughs> it's a very encouraging uh, passage, too. It's mm -hmm. almost like all you got to do is love your neighbors and and, and treat them like you, you love them and then you have can stand before God with confidence that's that's kind of a remarkable uh, you know because I uh that'd be intimidating to stand before God I mean the, the disciples that were there at the transfiguration I mean, it was it was overwhelming yeah. and if this I mean he's almost saying here we'll be better prepared in, in, in a way because we'll, we'll almost know what to expect, whereas the disciples were uh, like, uh, what is this? You know, they mm -hmm. didn't see that coming. Yeah. 
I had a I had a little problem with verse six. No one who abides in him sins, and no one who sins is either seen him or know him. Well, we all sin, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's why Christ came into this world to forgive our sins. And as long as we acknowledge our sins and and pray for forgiveness, we are forgiven. Mine has right. a footnote on verse six that says sins habitually and constantly. Oh, okay. Yeah, my footnote said, John is not asserting sinless perfection, but explaining that the believer's life is characterized not by sin, by, but by doing what is right. Yeah. And if you sin, you learn from it, and you do you do what's right the next time. Right. Yeah. So then that your sin doesn't have to lead to death anymore because Jesus took care of that for you. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. I just love verse 20. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts. And I think that ties into what you're saying, Helen. Like, you know, we are going to sin. So, but then we know that God is greater than our hearts. And I think, right, that turn of phrase is especially important for being able to forgive ourselves mm -hmm. and seek forgiveness. That's a really powerful passage. Yeah. It is because I think God doesn't want us beating ourselves up when we screw up because, mm -hmm. yeah, God's mercies are new every morning. Confess, receive forgiveness, and move ahead. Mm -hmm. And don't sin anymore. <laughs> Until the next time. Until the next time. <laughs> or, or try not to. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we do learn along the way, but yeah. That. Um, I have some footnotes on verses 19 to 24 that that were interesting. Um, God, who knows everything, judges us by the abiding relationship of love to others rather than by our passing moods, was one of them. Then 21 to 22, confidence in prayer results from obedience to God and strengthens assurance. Well, that would help when we go out and visit people and try to do a spontaneous prayer <laughs> and then belief in the name parentheses the total person of jesus christ and love are the basic ingredients of obedience wrought in us by the holy spirit mm -hmm. And then verse 9 has that um, God seed reference. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed, re seed remains in them. <clears throat> and that's denying Gnosticism again. And Peter talked about that too in 1 Peter. The advocate, or another word for it is the advocate. I like yeah, that. Yeah, that was good. The advocate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not alone. Mm -hmm. Although was that verse nine where that said seed? Mm -hmm. Well, my Bible. Um, but... In ours, in the Revised Standard, it's God's nature abides in Him, which is interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know what the message says. Well, with seed, don't, I mean, isn't He implying that we're actually literally children of God by? Uh, yeah. By blood. I mean, it's not uh, uh, not that we, I mean, that we we are part of the kingdom of God because we are born into it. Yeah, born again. Mm -hmm. Verse 16 is great too. You know, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Yeah. Pretty clear. That's a little harsh. 
<laughs> but but important. And I kind feel of humbling. Like, yeah, verse 17 just re-echoes James. Yep. If you um whoever has the world's goods and beholds their brother in need and closes their heart, you don't have the yep. love of God in you. Yeah. Yep. A lot of James in here for sure. But verse 16 makes me think of Alexei Navalny. He literally mm -hmm. laid down his life for his fellow Russians. I mean, he knew he knew when he went back to Russia. Yeah. Although I, you know, I don't know if he would have been safe anywhere. So he probably already also knew that. But um, our uh, this revised standard um, consistently says brethren instead of brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And and I I don't know whether uh, brother brethren has always been used to include men and women. Um, it's kind of an old timey word, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, old fashioned. It's a very old fashioned word. Mm -hmm. More inclusive. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this chapter? Not really any surprises in there. No. 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 Mm -hmm. All right. Can someone read chapter four for us? Well, before we move on, I had I do have one more footnote that that related to sure. something that was said in a minute ago. It says Jesus, in contrast to taking life, laid down his life. Mm. He is our pattern to lay down our lives may take the form of daily sacrifice for others in need. That's better than than laying down our lives and and dying. You know. <laughs> <laughs> like devoting your lives rather than sacrificing your lives. Yeah. yeah. That's better. Yeah. yeah. That's nice. I think it's about humility too. And like whatever you're doing in your life isn't that important. You're laying down, it can be about laying down the pride of the trajectory of your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's helpful. Uh, does someone want to read chapter four for us? Marilyn, thanks. This is the New American Standard. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know, the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that it is coming and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have beheld and bear witness that the father has sent the son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. 
God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Hmm. Yeah. I hear some part of the Compline prayers in there. Yeah, the New Zealand one. Uh, Thursdays, I think. Perfect love casts out fear. That uh, also uh, seems to address the Gnostics, up mm -hmm. especially in the very beginning. Um, exactly. When not believing Jesus Christ comes in the flesh from God. Yep. Yep. Now that we understand Gnostics. <laughs> Who knew that we had to learn about that? But yep. uh, right. I mean, there's still lots of people who don't think Jesus was a divine person. We just don't generally call them Gnostics. But... Mm -hmm. yeah. no. That um, uh, verse, verse uh, 20 toward the end um mm -hmm. wow that's a like um that's a kind of a smack in the face that if you yeah. say you love god but you hate your brother whom you have seen how can you love god yeah. who you don't see ouch you know that that's uh Powerful. that's also i think an argument against gnostics mm -hmm. yeah also i i'm worried that we're we're seeing uh false prophets and uh, those who are teaching the wrong or listening to the wrong spirit and not teaching love. I mean, some people are getting the impression that Christianity is is standing behind intolerance and uh, right. rather than inclusivity and, and uh, compassion for other people. And that's... Uh, that's, I think, what he was getting at in the, the first half of chapter four here. I mean, it was a different situation in his day, but we were facing the same thing. Catherine. People claiming to be preaching Christianity, and you don't, there's no love, there's no love in it. Well, it's the it fails the test, doesn't love it? Love is the test. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. There or not there, you know, what do you, what do you think? And it's clearly they, there's a lot of people preaching that fail that test. Yeah. One of the books that Catherine has recommended, and I don't know how widely she sent out this list, but it's um, it's written by a, a Episcopal priest that whom Catherine knows, so she might get her on the conference call if we ever have a discussion of this book. But um, it's called. The Seven Deadly Sins of White Christian Nationalism. Mm, I've heard of that one. Yeah. But yeah. I haven't read it yet. No, I I just got it. I That's on my pile of books to read when I'm laid up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And love is all in this chapter. God is love. God is love. God loved the world. God loves his son. You know, it's. But that, that you know, what Steve was saying, I, I wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm agree with that and kind of concerned that people not who, who really don't understand Christianity will get even a worse understanding of Christianity. Right. Yep. Some of those uh, false preachers are louder than our what we would consider the uh, preachers preaching the, the righteous message. They're they not more attention and then they get the they get the brand Christianity and Mm -hmm. claim it for themselves and well wait a minute wait a minute not the christianity uh, i know not fish curry's love is the way right it, it's hard to love your some people it's hard to love them 
so that's that's another thing that we need to work on. You know, how do you love somebody that is you think is not Christian? <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, you know, not because they're Jewish or anything, but because they're 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 hating, they're doing things wrong. I don't know. You know, mm -hmm. how do you love them? It, that's a hard thing. They know not what they do, right? Yeah. And what about the the Irish? They were the the Protestants fighting the Catholics. That was that was very bizarre. That happened not only in Ireland but also in France back with the Huguenots. Yeah, that's true. Way way a long time ago. And, and we it just also, heard it also happened in our in our country back in the where the pilgrims were very, you know, you, you could not believe any other way but what they believed. Otherwise they were you were out. You know? Yeah. And you had to, you had to go to another another state or another mm -hmm. territory. And we had just heard from Peter about not listening to the false prophets that twist the scripture and make it what they want. So yeah. And yet they're not open to um, the possibility that they might be wrong. You know, they think they're right just as much as we think we're right. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to address that. I mean, other than, uh, you know, I just have to live my life the best I can, I guess. But uh, and you test them. I mean, that's what the first um, verse is about. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Mm -hmm. If there's not love there, you'll know. Yeah, well, they they profess. There's a lot of people that profess to be Christian that don't act well. You know, mm -hmm. that don't yep. love their brother and sister. Yep. Or lay down their lives for their brothers and sisters. So yeah. that's hard. Yeah. Mm hmm. I think a lot. It takes a lot of humility to love someone who is acting evil, like you said, mm -hmm. Ellen. Just it's it's hard. You tend to want to berate them and just you know walk away and say, you know, you you're go live your life. We can't. I can't take you anymore. Mm -hmm. but I think if you show them love, maybe maybe that maybe that is what they need. To in order to open up to another way of thinking, yeah. I don't know. It's or it could be very fruitless too. <laughs> that is love, and like Susan was saying, Michael Curry's preaching on it, so it's yeah. nice to kind of fall in line with. What our hopes and beliefs are. There was a movie that came out. Um, it was in February. That was based on Michael Curry's book. Yeah, yeah. didn't you see it? I went to see it, and what I was amazed about in it was so much of it was set in Minnesota. Oh. The movie, oh. and uh, oh. but it it's it basically is is talking about. Um, showing love and acts of love in everyday life mm -hmm. a case for love right case for love yeah it, you know if anybody knows when that's going to be shown again we should put it in our bulletin or something well so Catherine that... I think is trying to arrange to, to have it shown and <laughs> Len Freeman was had done a review of the movie so he actually has access to it and he was going to check into whether or not he could Use his accent. Share it. Show it. Yeah. That'd be great. I'd love yeah. to see it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like it's taken from uh, First John <laughs> with all the love, you know. It mm -hmm. talks a lot about love. Well, it's great to hear John say, "You don't don't keep looking. You don't have to read between the lines. The message is simple. You know, keep yeah. it simple." What's not, I mean, you understand that everything else follows. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm 
details. It's really reassuring. Work, yeah, we'll work. I mean, you can work out the details yourselves. But if you remember what the prime command is, you'll, you'll do all right. Yep. Well, should we close out, John? So we'll want to read chapter five for us. Vita, thanks. Thank you. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is a child of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the witness because the Spirit is the truth. There are three witnesses, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has borne witness to his son. He who believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne to his son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. I write this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence which we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have obtained the requests made of him. If anyone sees his brother committing what is not a mortal sin, he will ask, and God he will ask, and God will give him life for those whose sin is not mortal. If there is sin which is mortal, I do not say that one is to pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin which is not mortal. We know that anyone born of God does not sin, but he who was born of God keeps him and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world is in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding to know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Kind of an odd way to end it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that was kind of sudden. <laughs> and oh yeah. <laughs> is uh is uh verse seven and eight is that where the concept of the Trinity was uh yeah I was um, looking into that. It's a it's a bunch of different things. So um it's a reference to the old testament law that required two or three witnesses. So it's from Deuteronomy 17, 6. On the testimony of two or three witnesses, a person is to be put to death, but no one is to be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. Um, so it's referencing that, but it's also uh, when Jesus spoke about for where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Um, so I think it's kind of transitioning it from the old law, of, like you need witnesses. Like, before you can punish someone to make it more about we need witnesses to gather and, and in Christ together. Um, it's kind of playing with that old law and new law interaction. It is a really interesting verse. Yeah. Um, I have a footnote about it that says that the spirit's witness is to the water, Jesus' mm -hmm. baptism, and to the blood, the cross. Yep. Yep. I have a question about sins, mortal sins and not mortal sins. Uh, my footnote says that mortal sins are not forgiven. 
<laughs> and I understand that Jesus forgives all sins. Right. Which verse is that again? Oh, if you see your brother or sister committing what is a mortal sin, you will ask and God will give life in such a one uh, that, and to those who oh, sin yeah. is not mortal. There, there is sin that is mortal. I do not say that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that is not mortal. So, yeah. And then my my footnote down here says, "Oh, where is it? Uh, sin is uh, sin is not mortal. It distinguishes a category of sin that cannot be give, forgiven." Elsewhere, sin is denying that God's spirit is at work in Jesus, which is Gnostic. That's Gnostic. Yeah. That's, yeah. I have a really different footnote. It says, so Is that mortal sin that can't be forgiven? I, that's what I don't know. Well, my understanding is that if you're following Christ, your sins can be forgiven. And so if you're of the camp that isn't following Christ, then your sins are going to lead to death. Yeah, that's so not that they're not forgivable. You're just not following Jesus. Yeah, yes, you yeah. absolutely deny Jesus. There, he's not going to forgive your sins. I mean, you you have to have the, the faith to be forgiven. Right. Yeah. My footnote on on um, verse sixteen says, "Sin which is mortal is not an act but a state." It is not for him to pray even concerning this. Oh, oh, okay. Here we go back yeah. to the Gnostics again. <laughs> We're uh, learning so much about Gnostics. <laughs> yeah. Mine says this letter is directed against Gnostic teaching, which denied the incarnation and threw off all moral restraints. It is probable that the Sin that leads to death refers to the Gnostics' adamant and persistent denial of the truth and to their shameless immorality. Okay, that's that's a mortal sin. Then. Mm -hmm. It's unrepentant sin leads to okay. spiritual death. Okay. Yeah. Do we, do we um, know what the mortal sins are? I mean, I'm assuming murder would be one, but um, are they the commandments that Moses got? From God for those I don't think I don't think those are all mortal sins mm. I, I hope not if you're repentant you know you you still have to be you go to jail or whatever you have to do but if you're repentant and God forgives you Jesus forgives you you know don't do it again <laughs> yeah like Hulda said the unrepentant sin is what's mortal denying yeah. God. I mean, the forgiveness is offered to you, and you say, "No, yeah, I, uh, mm. I don't want it. You don't get it." Yeah, and verse seventeen says, "All wrongdoing is sin." So that's a pretty big blanket there. Yeah, and there is sin that does not lead to death, and I think that again is tying in to um, Jesus being our advocate. Yes, it doesn't lead to death. Like Steve was saying, if you repent. Yeah. I'm remembering yeah. from my uh, Roman Catholic childhood that they did classify sin, mortal sins versus venial sins, and venial were lesser, yeah. but I yeah. never quite understood the, the comparison, but it maybe it's something like, you know, you're telling a lie, like, you know, grandma cooks dinner and you say, you know, this is really good. Grandma says, how's it taste? You say, this is really good, but it really tastes like, you know, not the best, but you don't want to hurt her feelings. So that doesn't really count. I think it's a bunch of claptrap. I think what yeah. um, what Hulda said at all unrighteousness is sin. So there's there's really, to me, there's no distinction. It's missing the mark. Mm -hmm. It's either love or it's not. Yeah. yeah. A venial sin might be uh, not treating somebody well, mm -hmm. you know, or yelling at them or, um, you know, something like that. Yeah. But murder without remorse, I think that's a mortal sin. Yeah. And then we were talking earlier about um, uh, not beating ourselves up. I think of how um, people who go through alcohol or drug rehab, 
and they start to confront all the damage they've done to their families and friends. There's a lot of um, forgiveness that has to happen them for themselves and then others for the, you know, the hurt that they experienced. And I, I just yeah. think, wow, you know, here we are beating ourselves up about, oh, we were very nice to somebody, which, which I do. <laughs> you know? Oh, I better uh, take, get some perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of punishment is just the consequences of our wrongdoing and, you know, the following this is what happens. You did this. This is what the consequence is. And it's painful. It can be really painful. Yeah. And that's enough punishment for some people. Others just never seem to catch on. And to know that you have Jesus as an advocate as you're Absolutely. standing there undoing it with someone. Yeah. yeah. So if people have time, I chose to focus on the God is love message from chapters three and four. I picked what wondrous love for our hymn. Um, and if you go on hymnary.org, it does list chapters three and four of first John being linked into this text. What wondrous love is this? Oh, my soul, oh, my soul. What wondrous love is this? Oh, my soul. What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down, oh my soul, when I was sinking down beneath God's righteous frown, Christ laid aside his crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. To God and to the Lamb I will sing, I will sing. To God and to the Lamb I will sing. To God and to the Lamb who is the great I am. While millions join the theme, I will sing, I will sing. While millions join the theme, I will sing. And um, the artwork I picked out, you know, just because I liked it, but it actually kind of works. It's called The Haunting and it's a, a woman and there's like a figure behind her who has wings and so I don't know you could either see it as an angel protecting her or one of the fallen trying to sway her I don't know just uh leave that open to your own interpretation but I thought it kind of fit in surprisingly well to what we've been reading here we go <laughs> Lovely. I like that one. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, um, I love that hymn. Reminds me of Holy Week. Yeah. See that. Um, yeah, so for next time we'll read two John, three John, and Jude. They're all pretty short. So um it'll be interesting to see what Bible Project says about some of them too. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Have a good week, everybody. Yeah. Are we doing noonday prayer? Yeah. Okay. Do it. Alrighty. Just a minute. Yeah.